Welcome to Face to Face. And today we're going to talk about Cuba. We're going to talk about education. We're going to talk about documentary. And I'm with uh, Christian Murphy, who just make a, a new documentary uh, on, uh, on the education and on the, on the process of 1961 in Cuba. Welcome to Face to Face, Catherine. Thank you so much for having me. So how did you end up making documentary and how did you end up in Cuba with two different and two complicated situation for for a US uh, citizen? Yeah. Um I first went to Cuba in the 1990s and I went uh to sort of explore Cuba for the first time. I grew up hearing stories about Cuba because my grandmother grew up in Cuba and I grew up close to her and so My sister and I were sort of raised on stories about Cuba, which is unusual, I suppose, in the U.S. Um, but they, but anyway, so the stories of my grandmother's childhood, they all happened there. So I was sort of fascinated. And after the Berlin Wall fell and Cuba was suddenly in the news a lot, which before it had been largely invisible, you know, mm -hmm. negative when present, but largely invisible, it, uh, there was a lot more news about Cuba. And so I thought it was the right time to go. So I first went in the early 90s and I got so fascinated with Cuba and fascinated with U.S.-Cuba relations, the long history of U.S.-Cuba Yeah, it was very complicated. Present, yeah. <laughs> and I also became very interested with, you know, the U.S. We In the U.S., we hear so much about what Cuba has done wrong, but we don't hear much about what Cuba has done right. Of course. And the global lessons you know, that Cuba has for the rest of the world, sort of the social development model. So I decided to stay there and study. So I spent much of the 1990s in Cuba doing research on different aspects of, uh, of life and society in Cuba. And wow. out of that work was born uh, this oral history project on the 1961 Cuban literacy campaign in which I interviewed about 80 Uh, you know, 75, 80 of the youngest teachers from 1961. I was really focusing on the youngest women, but young women and men, mostly young women, but really those young teachers that were 12, 13, 14, 15 years old and went out to spend a year of their lives teaching others how to read and write in 1961. And That's seeing true. that, yeah. No, it was a volunteer work. It was a volunteer campaign for people to do it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. They made an open call. I mean, Cuba announced in the United Nations uh, General Assembly in September of 1960, Cuba announced that they would become free of illiteracy or they would become fully literate within one year, which is a seemingly impossible claim, even in the world of today and even for a country with many resources. So for a small country with scarce resources, it was just a seemingly impossible task. Well, they set about doing it. They put out an open call for volunteer teachers wow. and a quarter million people uh, stepped forward to volunteer. And almost half of those were teenagers and youth and young people. So we, before we go, we go back too long on this, how did you end up making documentary? What was your, uh, your background? What, what? Uh, I studied sociology. So I studied social science. A lot of people get, you know, people get into documentary from the social sciences a lot uh -huh. and from the, you know, from fine arts or from uh, or from social sciences, um, as well as from film, because it's also, you know, social documentation is has one toe in the cinema universe, but it also has a lot in the in the world of the social sciences and in a way to document humanity. So I was just recording these testimonies and it, it sort of cried out to be a film. I had worked peripherally on a couple of films for friends, but I wasn't planning on making, oh, making, making film myself. No, but this, this story uh, required it. And, and so education um, aspect in, in Cuba, do you think that's what makes the country Uh, what it is today is this, this very strong base of, of people who are like have the strength of, <laughs> of a lion to fight against a, a, a kinds of monsters in some ways. Yeah. Education is one of the pillars. I mean, they set out to with a sort of a 10 point program that was the platform of the Cuban Revolution. They redistributed land so that people were working the land like landless farmers, sharecroppers migrant farmers got land titles 
They, uh, you know, they nationalized extensive land holdings. It was largely owned by U.S. corporations in the sugar industry, and they redistributed it to uh, to peasant farmers and sharecroppers and landless uh, migrant farmers. They made education free. They made healthcare free and universal. And um, it just was a whole different way of designing a society. They made a radical rupture with the past and they said, rather than a society based on social exclusion, now we're gonna make a society based on social inclusion and healthcare and education and housing and land ownership is now for everyone. So I think, you know, you can look at the at the sort of social transformation process that was the Cuban Revolution. You can look at it intensely and it, it merits being looked at closely through any of these lenses. Well, I come at that through the lens of education and through that first huge leap toward a long term process of building a national education system that was precisely the national campaign for full literacy in 1961. So. Um, so I know, uh, I mean, we heard very much about the, the Cuban doctors and, and with the, the, the push of having them uh, getting the Nobel Peace Prize. Now, does, do you think that coming from that route, the same, the, same, uh, the same direction? Absolutely. I think it's very important, and I'm glad that you mentioned, I think it's really important, this campaign. There's a global campaign right now to nominate the Cuban medical brigades, the Henry Reeve Brigade and others, the Cuban International Medical Brigades for the Nobel Peace Prize. Because in during Ebola, during all kinds of times of crisis, um, terremotos, earthquakes, yep. earthquakes and hurricanes around the world, they send doctors to do uh, medical relief work. And they are doing the same with COVID now. And they're, they're all over the world in numerous countries, working with the doctors, working in local hospitals and treating people with COVID and risking their own lives, right? And working on the vaccine too. I mean, they, they, are, very, uh, they are very active in, in Cuba itself and also um, in Africa and South America and, and, and you know, even in the US, but the US doesn't like them very much. We've been asking people and, and cities, and there actually have been resolutions from numerous cities, San Francisco, Chicago. Um, there have been resolutions asking to bring Cuban doctors to the United States. New Orleans was asking for Cuban doctors after Hurricane Katrina, and, yeah. that, and they were ready to go. They had backpacks on, they were ready to go, but the US wouldn't let them in. But mm -hmm. recognizing the contributions of the Cuban Medical Brigade is huge, and the Cuban Nobel Campaign, if any of your listeners aren't uh, familiar with it, they really should get, there's all, there's a major campaign right now. Um, I think it's tomorrow that they're gonna announce the winners, the Nobel winners from last year. Um, but so we're pushing and I uh, have been participated in that campaign as well. So all, you know, every country has, uh, um, and importantly, the US also. Oh, no, no, we, we, are, we are publishing, we are doing the petition, we are trying everything we can in Presenza to, to be uh, beyond the doctor. Because well, we still need signatories, we still need people to sign up uh, to add their names to the campaign and to endorse and to help spread the word. Because I think for that, you know, part of what's so important about that is to say the people of the world recognize the Cuban medical brigades, their global uh, contributions. This is what a country should do. This should be all every nation's foreign policy should be to send not to send military units, but to send doctors Absolutely. and teachers. And Cuba, which is a tiny country with a very scarce resources, that's what they yeah. give to the world. And we all on top of it, they have very little resources and they are sanctioned by the US all the time. So it's even when they try to to expand their uh, uh, their economical development, they have been banned, they have been uh, sanctioned, they have been uh, the flight, you cannot go there, you cannot, uh, the tourism is very complicated, only people from Europe and, and few places can go there. I mean, it's a challenge for, uh, for Cuba and to be able to maintain. Yeah, and the Trump administration has really been uh, clamping down in this time of pandemic, yeah. where you would think for humanitarian reasons they could actually relax the trade and travel blockade, yeah. um, but actually they're making it tighter. So yeah. Trump together with Marco Rubio and numerous other- uh, That come from the, the, the politics of going against, uh, against Obama. So everything Obama did, we need to, uh, he has to be destroyed, he has to be removed. So the Cubans are paying the price. 
And they also want to just punish Cuba. They want to punish Cuba. Cuba is a threat of a good example. Cuba shows that another path is possible. They're, yeah. threat they're punishing Cuba for wanting to be independent, for exercising their independence and their self-determination, yeah. for wanting yeah. to run their own if national affairs, and for yeah. taking a different road and a different path and showing that it's possible. Yeah. Because isn't it embarrassing for the United States of this tiny little country, nine miles to the south, actually gives health care to everyone, houses everyone, gives education to everyone. It, it, it sort of, uh, it exposes the myth that it's not possible. And it's very a, close from the border. So it's, it's, it's in your face in some way. It's like, uh, if a country like this can do it, how the U.S. Ca cannot manage to, uh, to provide even food for for millions of people it, it's uh, so before we um, we we have the, the a short clip of the of the documentary uh, can you talk briefly about the, the education in the us and and how do you see the situation or the process of destruction of the public education as we know it in the past we're in a very difficult situation in the United States right now where there's major attempts at privatization of education. It's happening both in the elementary level, like K to 12 level, and also in higher education, this sort of neoliberal university. Um, the universities are not hiring, uh, like 80% of the new hires are adjuncts now, so they're not full professors. They're like uh, freelance professors and have very low salaries, don't have offices, don't have benefits, don't often have a desk. So they meet with their students like at the coffee shop. And so the students are paying more tuition than ever, you know, than mm -hmm. decades. Yeah, yeah, because in New York, it was free at some point. In um, Many parts of the United States education was free or almost free for a yeah. decade. It's so yeah. expensive now, higher education. Um, so the students are paying more, but the professors are earning less. And the money is just going to these to sports programs and uh, high only paid administration, right? Which is not going toward edu education at all. But we're also facing privatization in the K to 12, you know, primary and secondary education levels with uh, the expansion of charter schools, which is sort of a, a crack closure of schools. Chicago has closed over 50 public schools wow. in years. And it's, it's a really scary situation. And then also with high stakes testing, school to prison pipeline, we really need to, um, Put a lot of focus on not allowing our public education system to be entirely privatized. Okay, having said that, I'm going to show the clip now, and then we go to the movie. Okay? Yeah. It's incredible that it's been so long. Because I was 14 years old. 14. importante para mí en dos sentidos. Fue la, la actividad en la que me integré a una labor social por primera vez en mi vida, porque hasta ese momento solamente era un estudiante y un hijo de una familia. Y, y con esa actividad me inauguré como participante, como activo dentro de la sociedad. ¿no? So you just came out with uh, the premiere of the documentary, and how did you how did you meet with Silvio Rodriguez? What what was your your process? Because I think that's the main that's the main characters into the documentary. No. Yes, it's all uh, his. It's all about this experience that he had as a individual. So um, we. I spent several years filming interviews in Cuba with the youngest teachers from the 1961 literacy campaign, mostly with young women, but also with some young men, including the incredible testimony of Silvio Rodriguez. Well, Silvio Rodriguez is really one of the most uh, respected or beloved poets and songwriters in the Spanish language. And so um, 
there are people, thousands of people around the world who know all of his songs, every word to every song, but very few people know that when he was 14 years old, he had the, you know, that his main, his first coming of age moment. This feels cool. Was his first calling was in the literacy campaign. So um, we interviewed him. I, the, the film crew I was working with in Cuba, an incredible cinematographer named Roberto Chile, and our, one of the producing institutions is the Martin Luther King Center in Havana. They knew, uh, Roberto Chile knew, and some of the producers knew that, uh, that Silvio Rodriguez had been a literacy teacher, and they really encouraged me to uh, reach out to him. And he was very generous, generous uh, to give us the interview and generous with his time, and generous in really sharing that story with us in a deep and beautiful way. It's very beautiful, very poetic, the way he talks about it, but also, you know, it's, it's deep, but also very modest. Um, and he says it was his first calling, that that was the first time he did something for, for his country, for the world, and that was sort of where he fell in love with this, uh, the act of service. And yeah, it, it, it became, that's not a small statement. No, he became very active into, uh, into that's how he discovered that you can be a citizen of a country and, and, be, and take part of it. Uh, it's, I, I mean, it's, it's a very short extract that I saw, but it, it's a very powerful uh, experience when you are 14, I imagine, to be able to say, you know, I have a place and I can do and I can contribute to society that will avoid in, here in this country that will avoid a lot of depression and 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 suicide and so on and so forth. It's it's a very powerful uh when the society can 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 give a space like this for people it's very yeah absolutely and so, what did you what did you discover about 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 the, the his process of getting engaged into uh, into that campaign? Well, you know, most of the people that we interviewed define it as this transformative moment in their lives, as their coming of age moment. You know, again, because I was focusing on these adolescent teachers. Yeah. Um, for most of them, it was the first time they were away from their homes. They had to sort of negotiate with their parents to allow them to go because parents were really scared. It yeah. was a dangerous time. Yeah. And um, and they were very young. So they started with this negotiation with their parents to allow them to go and then went out into the world and learned about, you know, the world and themselves and their country and what and the inequities of their country. So many of them fell in love with teaching or they fell in love with service. They fell in love with this whole, you know, the transformation that was happening in their country. So it's really about the very personal transformations that were happening on the, and the macro transformation of transforming the, the country. Right. And those things are like in it. You can't pull them apart. They're all there. So all of the teachers talk about this moment being really important and, um, you know, the, the first film we did 10 years ago is called Maestra. It was um, with eight testimonies of, the, some of, of eight of the youngest women teachers. But then now, a decade later, so Maestra continues to screen frequently, regularly. It's been translated into six languages. Oh, and wow. now, a decade later, I'm starting to take out some of the individual interviews, um, starting with Silvio Rodriguez, take out the individual interviews and launch them as films, you know, profile films of their own. So the Silvio film, My First Calling, it's a 25 minute, 25 minute documentary, like a mid-length doc, 25 minutes, in, exclusively with the interview of Silvio, but also with these gems of the Cuban film archives, especially the Noticieros Latinoamericanos, the Latin American newsreels that Ikai produced, Santiago Alvarez, one of the great documentary filmmakers of all time, who was Cuban, uh, produced this series of newsreels over decades. And they used to show in the Cuban cinemas before the feature films. And so after 10 years of research, we found new materials um, assisted by Santiago Alvarez's widow, Lázara Herrera, who runs a, a documentary festival in Santiago de Cuba, and just treasures that we pulled into this film to wow. illustrate, you know, what was happening in the country at the time. So, and now what's going to happen to the documentary? Are you, um, it, it's, um, you, you, 
you tour schools. I don't know. I don't know the life of, of the life type. of a film, right? So after you launch it, the, you sort of the first uh, phase, the the, the first uh, months up to a year of a film usually go to film festivals, and oh. so we already were in the International Documentary Festival of Buenos Aires, Argentina. That was yeah. the week after the launch. Um, we'll be in the Cuban Film Festival in Glasgow, Scotland next month. And we're applying to a number of other documentary festivals, Latin American festivals and Spanish language festivals and documentary festivals. That will take maybe six months to a year, depending okay. on what festivals it's accepted to. But we also have a long-term commitment to make it available to um, educators and organizers. So if anyone out there, you know, loves Silvio, cares about Silvio, wants to teach with this film, you know, teaches music, musicology, or Latin American history, um, we have a commitment to make it available to all educators. So people are welcome to get in touch with us. No, and it's a very good way to to get in schools in South America, in Latin America, because I'm sure, uh, I mean, not the young people, but I'm sure the parents need <laughs> at least need, uh, know him. So it, it could be a good way to, um, to make the bridge. Yeah. Um, you wanted to talk a little bit about the, the biggest project you cover in with Brazil and other places? Yeah, I just wanted to be sure to just to um, uh, talk about the the larger landscape that our our project, which is called the Literacy Project. You know, we have this whole series on Cuba, but it's part of a larger series about um, popular education and emancipatory education in the Americas. So we have done interviews in Brazil with some of the young people that were mentored by Paulo Freire, and we'll be doing a piece with them next year. We're doing some work with MST, the Brazilian Landless Workers Movement, and we're doing also a series on social justice educators in the United States. Um, the, the first piece on that, we released a nine minute film uh, last year about literacy and voting schools in African-American communities in South Carolina in the 1950s, a network of schools called Citizenship Schools that were started by a very important Black educator named Septima Clark, who really should be a household name. She should be in every U.S. history textbook in the United States. Um, yeah, she started together with others, a, a really important network of schools called Citizenship Schools that spread throughout the South in the 1950s and really were part of the you know, precursor to the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Wow. Okay, anything else before we wrap up? Just that people can find us at theliteracyproject.org. We also have a YouTube channel where our content streams open and free. Uh, it's Literacy Project Films on YouTube, and people can get in touch with us through either of those methods, and we'd love to talk to all the liberation educators out there. Thank you so much, Catherine, for being on the show. That was your show face to face and please keep watching your news on presenza.com and we hope to see you and hear from you very soon. Thank you very much.